We're here today to listen to and learn from and talk to Lily Coppell, uh, author of a fascinating new book called The Red Leather Diary. And I first learned about the book when I read a review of it in the New York Times book review. And I'm an avid fan of found text and dumpster diving. And so when I read the story of finding such a rich, personal, historic treasure trove, a combination of just sheer diarism, personal writing, the fact that it was in a dumpster and being thrown away, kind of an interesting connection of things. And so I wanted to bring her in to tell more about the story, not just the story of her experience with the book, uh, but the stories that were contained in the book as well. A little bit about Lily before we, we bring her up here. Uh, she currently writes for the New York Times and other publications. Uh, she spent much of her time at the Times, uh, started as a writer and contributor to uh, Boldface Names, and uh, Gawker at one time called her the bravest gossip reporter ever, or alive. I actually forget exactly what it was, uh, because she was thrown out of an event, and maybe she'll tell us about that. Um, and she's now contributing to Glamour, The Forward, and working on a new book. And so without further ado, The Red Leather Diary, Lily Coppell. Thank you. It's really wonderful to be here. Um, this story is really a fairy tale, but it's a true one. And I'm going to start by just reading from the beginning of the book and then tell you how I entered into this magical story. Once upon a time, the diary had a tiny key. Little red flakes now crumble off the worn cover. For more than half a century, its tarnished latch unlocked. The red leather diary lay silent inside an old steamer trunk strewn with vintage labels evoking the glamorous age of ocean liner travel. This book belongs to, reads the frontispiece, followed by Florence Wolfson scrawled in faded black ink. Inside, in brief breathless dispatches written on gold-edged pages, the journal recorded five years in the life and times of a smart and headstrong New York teenager, a young woman who loved Baudelaire, Central Park, and men and women with equal abandon. Tucked within the diary like a pressed flower is a yellowed newspaper clipping, the photograph of a girl with huge soulful eyes and marcelled blonde hair atopped a heart-shaped face stares out of the brittle scrap. The diary was a gift for her 14th birthday on August 11th, 1929, and she wrote a few lines faithfully every day until she turned 19. Then, like so many relics of time past, it was forgotten. The trunk in turn languished in the basement of 98 Riverside Drive, a pre-war apartment house at 82nd Street, until October 2003, when the management decided it was time to clear out the storage area. The trunk was one of a room full, carted to a waiting dumpster, and is often the case in New York, trash and treasure were bedfellows. Some passerby jimmied open the locks and pried apart the trunk's sides in search of old money. Others stared transfixed, as if gazing into a shipwreck, at the treasures spilling from the warped cedar drawers, a flowered kimono, a beaded flapper dress, a cloth-bound volume of Tennyson's poems, half of a baby's red sweater still hanging from its knitting needles. A single limp silk glove fluttered like a small flag. But the diary seems a particularly eloquent survivor of another age. It was as if a corsage, once pinned to a girl's dress, were preserved for three quarters of a century, faded ribbons intact, the scent still lingering on its petals. Through a serendipitous chain of events, the diary was given the chance to tell its story. And here's where, where I really fit into the picture. I grew up in Chicago and moved to New York to go to college. And after I graduated from Barnard, I knew that I wanted to become a writer. And instead of like most of my friends moving to the Lower East Side or to Brooklyn, I took kind of a 
unusual choice, and I rented the room in the apartment of a rather eccentric woman on the Upper West Side. And I was living in this lavender painted bedroom. It was a bit like the Barbizon, I imagine. At first I thought it was kind of gonna be my nice B&B, but then little rules started creeping up like no men allowed. And it was me, my landlady, and her blind cat. And I was feeling, you know, rather invisible um, between my bedroom and the front door. But things weren't so bad. I had um, landed a job at the New York Times, and I was working as a news clerk initially, um, answering phones for editors on the Metro desk, helping to coordinate breaking news coverage, all the while trying to get my own byline into the paper. And my first assignments were celebrity reporting. So I had this Cinderella transformation like every night going from desk clerk to covering the red carpet. And I was interviewing everybody from Clint Eastwood about his love of gardening and transcendental meditation to Morgan Freeman to I won the um, Gawker description best gossip reporter ever when James Gandolfini asked me out on a date at Elaine's. And I used this as really the matter for the column the next day. And this was written into a small play called The Old Man and the She. Um, Shirley MacLaine tried to convince me of a past life during a two hour interview in a empty ballroom on this red love seat. But as a young person living in New York, searching for love and meaning in my own life, and as a writer, more importantly, a good story, I knew this wasn't going to be found on these sound bites on the red carpet. Well, this all did come to me, but in this very unusual package, which is that one morning, I was late for work. This was October 2003. And I came out of my apartment building on 82nd Street and Riverside Drive and parked in front of the building's awning was this rusted red dumpster. And one side was down. And I could see at a glance that there were about 50 old steamer trunks. And these are the old trunks that were brought on ocean liners across the Atlantic, studded with these brass rivets and plastered still with their vintage labels from Paris, London, Monaco. One in particular was the Anne Frank Diary Hotel in Amsterdam. And despite being dressed and late for work, this just seemed like an absolute message in a bottle to me. And I knew they wouldn't be around for long. So I grabbed the dumpster's grimy edge. I pulled myself up and I was balancing in my ballet flats on these like six trunks deep, kind of wondering when I'd had my last tetanus shot, and started excavating them. And each one opened like a small closet, one side fitted with drawers, the other with hangers, and there was a flapper dress. There was this gorgeous old coat from Bergdorf's that had a, there was tangerine boucle with a single Bakelite button and an iridescent silk lining and only needed a trip to the dry cleaner in which I now wear. There was a whole collection of vintage handbags, each one really a time capsule or a Cornell box, if you will, still with their little match boxes from Shrafts in El Morocco, a woman's lipstick called Bachelor's Carnation from Revlon, little crumpled notes that said, Pianos tune, carpet down, pick up bra from Saks. And I just got this absolute whiff of the past and how life was lived among a certain set in the 1920s and the 1930s. I mean, think of this dumpster, if you will, is this large hard drive that I just found abandoned outside of my building. And what emerged from this virtual urban shipwreck was this young woman's diary that was kept in New York between 1929 and 1934 by a young woman named Florence Wolfson. And I brought my pile upstairs that night and I opened the diary and I was really transported into this young woman's world. 
and had no idea when I first cracked open its rusted brass latch that it would be a story that completely touched my life and everybody who comes into contact with this story. And I'm going to read to you some of Florence's entries. It's nearly 2,000 entries painted a portrait of a teenager obsessed with her appearance and the meaning of her existence, meeting friends for tea at Shrafts, night clubbing at El Morocco, dancing at the Hotel Pennsylvania, the New Yorker Hotel, and the Savoy Ballroom. January 16, 1930. I bought a pair of patent leather opera pumps with real high heels. April 20th, 1931. Dyed my eyebrows and eyelashes and I've absolutely ruined my face. Observations about frivolous matters were interspersed with heartfelt reflections about the books she loved. Balzac and Flaubert were particular favorites. August 3rd, 1932. Spent all day reading something of Jane Austen's. How refreshing, how novel, has her breed died out? And here I was holding Florence's crumbling book, which looks just like the book cover, and it's lined in these old financial stock listings from the newspaper. And I could only kind of think to myself, well, has her breed died out? Music, a recurring theme, scored her life with exclamation points. Beethoven symphonies, Bach fugues, June 28th. 1932. Have stuffed myself with Mozart and Beethoven. I feel like a ripe apricot. I'm dizzy with the exotic. And I thought, well, who doesn't want to feel like a ripe apricot? I certainly do. But it really spoke to Florence's daily activities, which were filling herself with literature and music and art. And these were the things that she needed to survive. The young woman who emerged from the diary's pages had huge ambitions, even if chasing them proved daunting. February 21st, 1931. Went to the Museum of Modern Art and almost passed out from sheer jealousy. I can't even paint an apple yet. It's heartbreaking. And I think this is an experience that we can all relate to when we just kind of question what we want to contribute to the world. And here was this young woman, although I was separated from her by 75 years, I felt that we were on a very similar path. And what were the chances that myself as a young writer had really picked up this young woman's story where she had left off? She was planning a play on Wordsworth. She says, possibilities are infinite. And what she really craved was to be enveloped in a grand passion they would transform her life. On July 3rd, 1932, she writes, five hours of tennis in glorious happiness. All I want is someone to love. I feel incomplete. Florence Wolfson was the daughter of two Russian immigrants who had come to the country around 1906. Her mother had started out as a seamstress on the Lower East Side. Her father worked his way up to be a prominent Manhattan physician, um, and Florence's mother, Rebecca Wolfson, eventually owned a shop on Madison Avenue where she outfitted the women of the era. And so Florence, when she was keeping the diary between 14 and 19, was really outfitted in the most beautiful clothes, these velvet coats with big silver fox collars and dresses, which I learned a new term for, which was creating a sensation in. But at 15, well, the diary was kept between 14 and 19, but it really read like the chronicle or let's say a sex in the city of the 30s. I mean, Florence lived with an incredible degree of independence. And I think what really struck me about her, unlike many of my contemporaries, um, was that Florence was really writing her story as she went along and she wasn't modeling herself on anyone else, but that there was just a uniqueness to her life and to um, who she was writing herself into, if you will. Um, she, at 15, she's working on a novel. And she says, I'm working on a novel. You didn't know I was working on one, did you? But what adolescent is an adolescent without a novel? 
And here I'm holding her book and I'm just thinking again, having this conversation across time, well, Florence, how true, and here I found your book. In the summer, there were these trips to the Catskills, which were like a dirty dancing of the 30s, when at 13, Florence met her husband, who she would later marry on the eve of her 24th birthday and stay, stay married to for 67 years. She described him as being one of eight beautiful brothers built like Greek gods who worked their, fa- their parents' little hotel called Spring Lake, which was a transformed farm. Florence was a theater nut, and she was constantly at museums and at the opera and the symphony and going to see the performances of her obsession, an actress named Eva Ligellian, who was notoriously lesbian, but was known for her performances of Alice in Wonderland, Hedda Gabler, and Peter Pan. And as Peter Pan, she would fly over the audience in this skimpy, emerald green leotard um, suspended by this invisible, invisible fishing line. And it must have been quite something to be sitting underneath her. But Florence loved her not only because she was a beautiful actress in commanding, but Florence felt that she was above the arrogance of men. And here is really the example of an independent woman. So Florence writes to her, gets no response, but um, Florence is someone who, if she set her mind to something, she was going to make sure it happened. So she draws a portrait of the great actress, comes to see her performance one night, gives it to an usher afterwards, and says, give this to Miss Legellian, tell her I want to see her. So is ushered backstage through these winding dark corridors into um, Eva's dressing room. She's framed by these lights and their powder puffs and makeup around her. And Florence basically says, thank you so much for seeing me. I love you. And Eva Legellian's girlfriend is there and kind of this dramatic scene ensued. But, um, you know, really uh, that was very much Florence. I mean, really had a flair for the dramatic. And I'll let you read it to really find out what played out. But I never knew where this woman's diary was going to lead me. She was internally reflective, but also very adventurous. Um, She went to the first all-women's high school in New York, which was on West 114th Street. Um, The girls were known as the Owlettes after their mascot, which was Minerva. And their ranks had included the prolific diarist Anais Nin, Lillian Hellman, Jean Stapleton. Then Florence graduated from high school at 15. She had an IQ of 150, entered Hunter. She had wanted to go to school at Barnard, but it was the Depression, and that didn't work out. So she entered this population of the daughters of really immigrants who had come to New York, these fearless young women who, if you look through their yearbook, as I did when reading the book, you're just met with these faces that look so directed into the future, all with their matching marcelled hair and these um, black v-necks. And Florence was the editor-in-chief of their literary journal called Echo. On her staff was Joy Davidman, a young woman who would later marry C.S. Lewis, and Bell Kaufman, later the best-selling author of Up the Down Staircase. Then Florence graduated and entered Columbia, where she set about doing a very unlikely thing at the time, which was assembling a literary salon, which she held in her parents' Upper East Side apartment. And she invited her young friends, the poets Delmore Schwartz and John Berryman, who would later go on to really illustrious literary careers. And Florence remembered of the time bending down to light the fireplace, And as she did, she would unpin her long blonde hair and let it cascade down her shoulders as her guests debated the poetics of Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas. And she admitted, actually, she hadn't read any of them at the first meeting, but then ran out and got them and devoured them. But that was really Florence, this combination of someone who was very aware of her powers of seduction, but also really a razor-sharp intellect. 
when I first read the diary, I thought, well, here's a chronicle of really a nice Jewish daughter. She was jaunting through Central Park on horseback. She was playing the piano and tennis. And then at one point, I stumbled upon an entry which said, slept with Pearl tonight. It was beautiful. There is nothing so gratifying as physical intimacy with one you like. And I thought, well, wow, Florence, you know, much more adventurous than I had initially thought. But the diary was really riddled with her love affairs and her search for self. Long before there were self-help sections at the bookstore, Florence Wolfson was a young woman who was really exploring who she was on the blank slate of her diary. So I had this crumbling book for three years, and it slept in my bedside table drawer, and I would go back to it often, and Florence had become really this guide for me in New York into navigating the city and my relationships. And I had, at the New York Times, I had kind of gotten away from doing celebrity reporting, which I ultimately wasn't interested in doing, and started writing features about vestiges of old New York. I was interested in those places and people that were disappearing as our whole world fills up with more Starbuckses and city banks and becomes more of a predictable corporate chain block by block. And I covered the Proust Society and the Finnegan's Wake Society. And one article I was particularly proud of was about Manhattan's last typewriter repairman who works in this crammed office in the Flatiron Building. And it's really like a going back into time when you go into this place. It's a frosted glass door stenciled with black letters that say room 807. And you walk in, and there's Paul Schweitzer, who runs it, telling you about his father, Abraham Schweitzer, who opened the business in 1932. Anyway, we got along really famously. Afterwards, he took me out for an egg cream at one of New York's remaining lunch counters, which is this place called Eisenberg's with 20 turned stools across from the Flatiron Building. And the day the story ran, I received a call completely out of the blue from a private investigator who explained that he was also a lover of old New York and that the article had really touched a nerve in him. And I gave him a call and we started talking. And Charlie, which is his name, he said, Charles Eric Gordon, not G. Gordon Liddy. Um, he explained that he was old fashioned and let's do this in person and not over the phone. So I said, all right, you know, kind of made me smile. And we met at Keene's Steakhouse in Midtown where these old clay pipes lined the ceiling. And it was founded, I think around 1885. And Charlie shows up and he's wearing a trench coat and his license plate is Sleuth 3. And as we sit down, he pulls a magnifying glass out of his pocket. And I'm just thinking, is this guy for real? Well, he was. And he starts telling me about his very unusual profession of finding missing persons in the internet age. But he really is, like I said, old school. And he has this collection of a thousand telephone books, which go back to the early 20th century, which he uses to locate people. And I shared the diary with him, although he usually is finding debt skippers and bail jumpers and you know more underworld characters. But he was really intrigued by Florence, who he felt was a femme fatale. And by searching New York City's birth records and using this collection of vintage telephone books, he knew that Florence was born in 1915 because she had received the diary for her 14th birthday in 1929. And he found three Florence Wolfsons who had been born in 15. Three, two were still, two were no longer alive and one still was. And the one that was, it was marked that her father was a Dr. Daniel Wolfson. Well, the only other clue I had to her identity besides the inscription of her name in the book was this brittle newspaper clipping that had fallen out of the diary's pages, which had said that Florence Wolfson lived at 1391 Madison Avenue. It was actually the first image I had of her um, because she had won this college scholarship, it had said. And so by 
he saw that on this one remaining Florence's birth certificate, um, there was a Dr. Daniel Wolfson used his telephone books. There was Dr. Daniel Wolfson at this same Madison Avenue address and triangulating this information and using voter registration records. He led me to Florence Howitt, a 90-year-old woman living with her husband of 67 years in Pompano Beach, Florida. And this was like the end of this very long personal quest. It had been three years, but I had really read that diary. I mean, I felt like it was my own diary, practically. And I picked up the phone to call Florence. And this was the first moment I really gave pause. And I thought, well, have I gone a little too far in my voyeuristic glimpse into this woman's life? And of course, the answer was yes, but the truth was, you know, I couldn't wait to meet her, and I had so many questions for her. And I felt that if Florence was anything like I had, you know, gleaned from her entries, that she would certainly want me to call. So I call up, this woman answers with the voice of an old stage actress, and I start explaining to her, really, the miraculous chain of events that led me to her. And Florence just says, oh my God, this is incredible. She said, who are you that you've searched me out of the universe? And she just ended with, well, I want to meet you. And of course, I wanted to meet her too. So a month later, she lives in Florida during the winter and then up north in the summer. I took the train from Grand Central, which I really think is the most romantic place to start a journey below the ceiling painted with constellations and the old information booth that you could ask any question to, not only train timetables. It almost seems like an early version of Google. And um, we arrive at um, this station, Westport, and Florence's daughter picked me up, Valerie, who's, in, who's 60, and went around these little winding roads past an old graveyard in Martha Stewart's old property to Florence's home, which is on Long Island Sound with these bobbing sailboats, and walked in, and Florence was sitting in her brown leather Eames chair, and she was unexpectedly glamorous and held her arms out to me and hugged me and said something very grandmotherly like, like, this girl's gorgeous. And I said, no, you are, you know, and I handed her the diary and it was really an incredible moment. She had completely forgotten about the existence of it, but she writes about it in the forward to the book, just what does it feel like when a forgotten chunk of your life is handed back to you? And she said, it stopped my heart for a moment. And here was Florence at 90, just paging through these worn pages and just began telling me, her story, and I felt that as if I had brought the young woman of the diary to meet her 90-year-old version, and it took them a little while to recognize each other, but ultimately they did. And although I had had these 2,000 entries, it was a five-year diary, so each one was only contained on four pale blue lines of the diary's pages, which were edged in gold. And I really needed Florence to tell me about her family. They were hardly mentioned. I mean, she was such a girl about town that, you know, she was talking about the theater and her boyfriends and, um, you know, these friendships that she was having. But I needed to learn about the Wolfson family, who she had come to, to really understand that she was part of this whole generation of Depression-era stamped children who were really trying to carve out an artistic and an intellectual life for themselves. And they were almost like forerunners of the 1960s. I mean, Florence warred with her parents to get them to send her to Europe in 1936, finally went, and she felt that Europe was a beacon, and this was the material she was going to need to really write in the future, which is what she wanted to do with her life. And she sailed to London, then went to Paris and Rome, where she embarked on this love affair with an Italian count named Filippo Canaletti Godente da Sorolo. A lot of names. He was a poet and a pilot and composed love verses to her, which were later published. Um, 
Then Florence actually, afterwards, she went on in the 1940s to write all sorts of articles for big women's magazines at the time, which really published prestigious um, fiction, women's um, ladies' home journal, good housekeeping, cosmopolitan. She wrote articles like what to do with the unmarried daughter and how to behave in public without an escort and how to quarrel with your husband after she was recently married. One of the bittersweet moments of the reunion between myself and Florence in her diary was she just turned to me and she said, from you know, reading about that young woman in the diary's pages, how did I end up living this ordinary life? And she kind of looked around herself living in Westport and kind of feeling it was quite suburban. And she talked about having a country club mentality and spending decades playing bridge and tennis and raising a family instead of really pursuing her artistic dream, which was to write. And she said, have I been a disappointment to you? And I said, no. And she hadn't. And I felt that you know the importance of this story was really that there was there was already a, there was a life here which was gonna you know was headed for a dumpster literally and would have never come to light and I was really interested in the twists and turns of this woman's life why a young woman who seemed so bent on transforming the world around her had disappeared into history and I think the beauty of this story and Florence turned to me and she said you've brought back my life. And I feel similarly, the diaries really become this portal into me writing my first book. But the full circle here is that this woman's words that she recorded in this diary, starry-eyed 16-year-old, locked behind a tiny key, she never thought they would be brought to the world, have come back to her at the end of her life and changed her life in such an unexpected way and have for so many people who've connected with the Red Leather Diary. And the, the book is really about all of our lives and the stories that we have to tell. And I think there's a lesson in there for all of us just as our world becomes more externalized and we're more focused on the exterior through celebrity culture and you know blogging and emailing, just where are those private repositories and kind of inner private spaces to just reflect on who we are. And um, the diary was a gift to Florence at 14 in 1929. And I really felt that it was a gift to me at 22 when I was searching for love and meaning in my own life. And it was a gift to, again to Florence at 90. And I really believe that the Red Leather Diary is a gift to everybody who connects with its message, which is really about finding the significance of all of our lives. So I'm going to pause there and see if there are any questions. And if there are, please use the microphone. Well, some people ask, well, you know, why did she throw out her diary? And the answer is that she didn't. Florence and I had both lived in the same apartment building about a few decades apart. There was this one trunk that was left in old tenant storage, and um, the diary was in there, so was her master's thesis from Columbia, this old telegram that her husband, who I first met when I met her, who was 95 and actually died last year, had written to her, and it just said, I love you, Nat. And in 2003, the building decided, well, you know, can't keep this old stuff forever. We have to, they wanted to expand the bike room, so they cleared it out. It was put into this dumpster, and there I was exiting the building fortuitously at that time and decided to suspend my rational self and climb in. I have a question. Um, how much time did you end up spending with Florence? I spent a lot of time with her. I spent a summer going back and forth and interviewing her. And it was really the process of excavating a life. And Florence really hasn't lost her flair for the dramatic. Although this was a personal quest and I really just wanted to reunite her with her diary and have these pressing questions 
answered. When Florence found out that I was also a writer, she said, this is a terrific story, you know. So it grew into a cover story for the New York Times City section, which was appropriately called Speak Memory. And then my editor at Harper found this story. And like everybody who connects this, this book, it's really about just finding the diary for themselves. And she wrote me, she said, I want to read more. Is this a book? And the most difficult thing was convincing Florence, not because she didn't want to tell her story. She thought I was joking. She said, I'm not a celebrity. I'm not a public figure. Who's going to be interested in reading about this? And the answer was, well, everybody, Florence, you know, because although it was a very specific story, it was really epic in scope. And it just talked about how, you know, our early ambitions can be lost, but then can be refound later in life. Um, was there anything in the book that she was embarrassed about and didn't want you to maybe publish or tell people? And obviously don't tell us what it is. Well, yes, there are definitely risque parts. I mean, that's what makes Florence such a fascinating character and to warrant really a story being written about her life. I mean, here was a young woman who explored herself intellectually, artistically, sexually. I mean, she definitely unbuttoned my notion of a 1930s girl. Um, Florence talks about that in the forward to her di forward to the book, and she just says, "Well, how did I feel about all these intimate thoughts being on public display?" She said, "Well, the young Florence would have said, go for it." So that's really who she still is today, and she felt that it was sort of ancient history. She wasn't going to embarrass anybody. Her daughters and granddaughters and great grandchildren think she's so cool now. She's scandalized some of her bridge friends, but you know, I think she's enjoying it. Um, was there anything from the trunk that you took that you gave back to her that you remembered was from her trunk? Well, the only things were really the diary and um, this autographed photograph from Eva Ligelli and this actress that she was entranced by in this old Western Union telegram. Um, I mean, the diary was enough because it was really her enduring work of art. I mean, it was really her younger self, if you will. And um, all the other things were great. I mean, any vintage clothing lover's dream. And I wear the flapper dress and I brought the coat from Bergdorf's to Florence and she slipped into it and the little saddle shoes danced around in. But I mean, those were really just the props of the real story, which was the one of the diary. Though those things certainly helped me as I embarked on writing her story, which was very much a process of like an actress taking on a role because it's an unusual book. It's an amalgam of memoir and biography. It's about finding the diary, part detective story of tracking down Florence, Florence at 90, reflecting on who she was and who she became and then using the diary as a portal to really bring her world back to life. And it's also a social history of New York at the time, little details like these mercury statuettes which decorated each of Fifth Avenue's traffic lights, or Florence riding on the top deck of the Fifth Avenue double-decker bus and staring into these lavish apartments and having this sort of voyeuristic experience. But it was really a city that was alive with jazz and theater and art and just all of the endless possibilities that New York still is, but sometimes I think is forgotten as we spend, you know, less time like in the real world and more in virtual spaces and really in front of our computers. But it was just this incredible story of pre-internet serendipity. I mean, of course, we're always making connections with people now that we're on Facebook and you know can send a quick email. Actually, my first step to find Florence was to Google her, of course. And nothing came up except for this Nassau site, which spoke about this fingernail-sized 
computer chip which had been spent sent into deep outer space with something like a million engraved names. It was some sort of charity, and one of them was Florence Wolfson. Well, I find it very funny to Google Florence today because you get pages and pages deep now of Florence in her diary and just how this diary, which was literally, you know, headed for a landfill, you know, was completely... Um, rescued. And this life was just opened up for other people to share and other people to, you know, think about their own stories and their parents' stories and their grandparents' stories and just how we see loved ones and friends around us. Um, But Florence and I were on the Today Show together. It's been quite a journey that's even larger than the book. She was talking like old friends with Kathy Lee Gifford, who was saying, well, before Florence Wolf's, you know, before Angelina Jolie, there was Florence Wolfson. And um, it was just really something. Florence turned to me before the camera started rolling and kind of squeezed my hand. And she said, this is a dream come true. This is a fairy tale. She was a little nervous. You know, I'm going to just kind of pretend it's not real. And I said, good idea, Florence, because it is still very hard to believe. Any other questions? All right, well, I think I'll conclude there. Thank you so much for having me, and I will be available to answer any questions in person and sign books. Thank you.